What is up, Fleet fans, and welcome back to my channel. Still on vacation, clearly. I'm a little bit burnt, and I'm still in my tank top. I have my wristband on from SeaWorld today, but you know what? We still have to keep making videos, still have to push them out, and I am talking all of the movies that I saw in June of 2019. We're talking theatrical releases or movies that released on demand or on Netflix. This month, I'm actually, I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I am not only doing everything that I just said, but I'm throwing in a film that wasn't actually a June release because everyone's been telling me, Austin, you have to watch Climax. It's one of the most interesting and weirdest movies of the year. Well, I watched Climax, and since I did not do an actual review on this channel, I want to talk about it. So you know what? I'm throwing this in the June tier list, even though it's kind of breaking the rules, but we like to do that sometimes. Also, I am not going to be able to see Yesterday before the end of June, so I may throw that film, even though it's June release, onto the July tier list, just because, once again, I'm on vacation, it's hard to see all of these things, but I want to make this video and I want to put it out before June is actually over and we move into another month, guys, halfway over with 2019, that is crazy. Usually, I'm doing stats, I'm going to cut straight to the tier list, but if you guys want to see all of my lists and everything I'm doing on Letterboxd, diary entries, reviews, every time I watch a movie, I log it on Letterboxd, you guys can keep up with that with me if you want to, the link is in the description, or if you don't like that kind of stuff, you don't have to, just keep watching these videos and I appreciate it and if you enjoy this tier list leave that thumbs up and if not well you don't have to all right let's move on to the first entry on this list this is a random order and we are actually starting with a very interesting Chinese film and this is another one that may not have been an actual June release because it was a very limited release I saw this in a very artistic theater and I don't really know anyone else who saw this film. I know Chris Stuckman saw it. He really enjoyed it. So Shadow is a really cool martial arts Chinese film from a filmmaker who has been bringing us consistent content for a long time. And then he moves into this American The Great Wall with Matt Damon, and he brings his style and flair, but you can tell that was a very Hollywoodized film. Shadow is the exact opposite. This is a deep character study. And while it has its action-filled moments that are very intense and one of the most well-shot movies I've seen all year, it also just focuses in on the characters, what everything means, the literal yin and yang of the situation. At the end of the day, guys, if you love films of this nature in this vein with this kind of hardcore intensity to it, I recommend Shadow. I don't know when it will be available wide release on DVD here or there, but I encourage you guys to check it out if you get the chance. And I'm actually placing this movie on the great tier. I can't quite get it to awesome, but I do thoroughly recommend this to anyone that loves movies in this nature. All right, spending too much time on one, let's move on to the next one. Next up, we're talking Men in Black International. And this is one I was really looking forward to, and then you see the lack of marketing, not very many trailers. Okay, what, what's going on with Men in Black? And then you see all of that behind-the-scenes drama, and you realize why this movie was such a mess. Now, I did enjoy it, I think, more than most people did, right? A lot of people hated this film, and that's warranted. I understand if you did not love Men in Black. I understand if you did not like Men in Black. And I, I didn't either of those things. I'm not going to say it's bad, though. I'm actually going to place Men in Black International on the meh tier because I just believe it's a meh movie. It's not a good movie. I wouldn't give it a positive score on Rotten Tomatoes, but I'm not going to sit here and say it's the worst thing I've seen all month. It was lazy. The script was sloppy, but you have great chemistry between our leads, Hemsworth and Thompson. Both of them really good. Yeah, Men in Black International. It's just one of those films that I wish was a bit better. Another movie that I was really looking forward to, and it just, it let me down. And I knew it wouldn't be the best, because once again, lack of marketing, and you're not going to lift the embargo until right before the release. Okay, that gives us the idea that the movie's going to be bad. I just, I wish Dark Phoenix would have ended off the X-Men reign that Fox has had for so long on a higher note than it actually did. It's another film that I can't say is awful, but I can say it's bad. A and not underwhelmingly bad, because I wasn't really anticipating this movie in the first place because I just saw, you could see that sloppiness to it all going in and the performances, while they were okay, you could just tell some of them didn't want to be there and the script itself, it kind of goes nowhere. There are some wonderful set pieces in this movie and so much potential, all of the potential in the world and moments that I thoroughly enjoyed. It's just the movie itself, it did not come together like I wanted it to. Next up is the film that everyone has been wanting me to review since it came out 
and this is Climax. And oh my god, A24. A24 is doing things right now that no other studio in Hollywood is even attempting to do. Is this a film that I would recommend to everyone? Absolutely not. I said this on my letterbox review. If I was to recommend this movie to my group of close friends that just, they're not as into films as I am, they would laugh at me and say I am never allowing you to recommend me anything ever again because this is just one giant, artistic, colorful dance party that turns into this slow descent into madness. The first half of the film is a lot of dancing, a lot of conversation, dialogue, build up, but it's leading you to something that happens at the halfway point. And as soon as that happens, you start literally going mad with these characters and you're trying to figure out, okay, why is this happening? What's going on? And then you throw yourself back to the dialogue. It's so elegantly put together. The direction is so fluid. Yes, it's weird. Yes, it's unlike anything you will see. Am I recommending this to the average moviegoer? No. But for what it did and for what it was going for, I'm actually going to place this on the great tier because I think Climax, in its own crazy way, was really great. Okay, next up, I Am Mother. Now, this was a Netflix movie that came out, I think, around the middle of June, and I wasn't anticipating it. I actually thought it was going to be really bad, but it ended up surprising me to no end. You have great talent in here. Uh, two actresses, three actresses, if you count Rose Byrne, who was incredible as the character of Mother, and you can anticipate some things that are going to happen later on in the movie. It's a bit predictable, and it takes, it pulls from films in the sci-fi vein that we have seen multiple times before, but it does it in this brand new and somewhat elegant way. The direction is really fluid. I can't wait to see what the director goes on to do next, and overall, guys, I Am Mother was actually a really good time. Can't say it's great because there were flaws, right? But at the end of the day, if you're looking for a good, solid, slow-building sci-fi movie on Netflix, this is another one that I can recommend. And then we come to one of those movies that I was just really excited to talk about again, even though I've done it multiple times on my channel. I had a Pixar tier list and a Toy Stories ranked video and a Toy Story review, but you know what? We're going to keep talking about it because this is, and I'm going to go ahead and place it on the tier that it belongs on, the most awesome movie I saw in the month of June. Oh, by the way, there is another movie that I saw that was really, really good, but it's not technically a June release, so I'm pushing Spider-Man Far From Home to the next video, just in case you guys are curious. But okay, back to Toy Story. Yeah, thoroughly enjoyed Toy Story 4. Now, I'm getting a bit of backlash, those vibes coming from Twitter and a bit online, like, okay, Toy Story 4, the story wasn't all there for me. Understandable. It did not live up to the original trilogy understandable because it's one of the best trilogies of all time but I personally thought the direction that they went in was warranted from what they gave us in Toy Story 3 and those very subtle plot points that they didn't have to cap off but they set them up in a way that beautifully paid off in this movie my childhood just the way that this film ends you're wiping the tear from your eye, you're realizing everything has come to fruition, and you can see the seeds planted in all three movies that are building up to this fourth movie that no one really wanted. I was so hesitant. I was the guy walking into the movie saying, yeah, we don't need a Toy Story 4, but I was walking out saying, I'm so glad we got a Toy Story 4. I loved it. Woody's storyline, one of the best character arcs in the history of of movies. I mean, it was so good. Tom Hanks as this character. The new cast was great. Keanu Reeves, Key and Peele, all of them. Gabby Gabby was a really cool villain. Went in a direction that I didn't anticipate. I've talked about Toy Story 4 like a lunatic, so let's move on to Murder Mystery. And you know, I did my review, and I got a bit more backlash than I did. It's kind of like a behind-the-scenes look on these movies once I put the reviews out, but Murder Mystery, for me was a surprise. And I'm not going to sit here and say it was genuinely a good movie. And because of that, I'm actually going to place it on the okay tier as opposed to the good tier. But you know what? Okay for Adam Sandler in the last 5-10 years is significantly better than anything else he's done other than his Netflix special, which was really good, and the Merowitz stories on Netflix, which is genuinely a great film. Otherwise, his stuff just hasn't lived up to the Happy Madison name that I think he envisioned so long ago with all of his 90s classics. But this film was actually fun. It was a bit funny. Jennifer Aniston was really good. Their chemistry carried the entire film. It's this murder mystery, and you know where it's going. It's predictable. It's a little silly. There's this thing that the extra does in one scene. It was a bit awkward, but you know what? The fact that I can sit here and say this movie was okay is just the best thing for Adam Sandler. So Adam Sandler, if you're going to keep making okay movies, 
you should probably step it up and make good movies. But this is okay. All right, we're moving on. Next up is the remake of Child's Play. Now, this is a movie that I had a lot of hesitation for, as I did for Men in Black and Dark Phoenix, and another film where the embargo lifts at the last, and I mean literally the day of, Child's Play didn't lift until that morning, right? So I'm reviewing this movie like, okay, I, this is going to be a stinker, and I walk into the theater, and I actually walked out having a pretty, I'm going to say a good time. I don't necessarily think the movie is all that good, but it was okay, man. I, I thought Child's Play had a bit of fun to it. Chucky, the voice from Mark Hamill was really good. The chemistry between he and Andy, the fact that they go in a different direction. They didn't just rehash the original Child's Play. They brought in an AI element, something that fits into 2019. The side characters, kind of unwarranted. Some of the jokes didn't necessarily work for me, and there were certain conversations I'm like, okay, why are you doing this when you should be doing that? But Child's Play surprised me because I expected it to be on one of these low tiers, and it ended up being okay. But for this movie, what I was anticipating, okay is really, really good. Now, a movie that wasn't okay, and I wanted it to be really good, Annabelle Comes Home. Annabelle Far From Home, Annabelle Home Alone. I, listen, this film had so much potential because it's the haunted house in the Warren's basement starring McKenna Grace as their daughter. How do you mess that up? And I'm not going to sit here and say they completely botched it. It's the worst movie I've seen all year. But for me, I'm going to say it was a bad movie. And the reason why I say that is because it had so much potential. You have a director with a ton of potential that has worked in this field before. And then you have a cast. And the cast was good. The characters that they played were not very well written, therefore I can't say I didn't like the direction that it went in, but the cast itself I think is what saved this movie from being truly awful, but overall Annabelle Comes Home, it was full of horror cliches and conventions, it's your typical jump scare, it wasn't a cohesive film, it was just, oh we're going to put our character in this situation, we're going to set up this villain for the next Conjuring movie, so on and so forth, it was just rinse and repeat all the way until the end of the movie, and because of that, I think Annabelle Comes Home sadly was kind of bad. Next up is uh, Anna Montana, and we're gonna we're gonna go ahead. It's just Anna. It's not Anna Montana. We're gonna put her on the meh tier because you know, I mean, there were some interesting twists in this film. The problem is there wasn't just one or two twists. They did a twist like every five minutes, and every single time they would do one, they would flash back to something that happened six months earlier, or two weeks earlier, or one year earlier, and you would think that's a cool concept, right? And it is cool at the beginning of the film, but it started to get old. You have a good cast, and you have interesting characters. The character of Anna was really good, and I thoroughly enjoyed what Killian Murphy did in this movie, Luke Evans. I mean, this is a great cast. It's just where Luke Besson takes this film is a direction that I have seen a thousand times before. This was an unneeded film. I don't know why we got Anna. I don't know why we got the Anna that we got, right? Full of so much potential. It's just the execution was a bit sloppy for me, and that's why I'm going to place it on the meh tier. Now, I don't think it's a bad or an awful film because it was packed full of talent. There were things in there that I enjoyed. There were two action scenes in particular that thoroughly entertained me, but I watched the movie like a week ago and I've already forgotten most of the things that have happened, and because of that, I'm putting it on the mat tier. Next up, now I didn't review this movie on my channel, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. This is called Rock My Heart, and Rock My Heart for me was a meh movie. This is a foreign film, and it's about a girl who has a condition, and she wants to take that condition to the extreme by finding a passion in horse racing. Okay, we've seen this movie before. It's all about the execution, right? Well, she finds love along the way, and some unexpected things happen. Absolutely. And I enjoyed the concept of the film. I know I keep saying that, but these movies, they're like, okay, it sounds interesting, but it ends up being the execution is what messes it up. Yeah, it's the same case for Rock My Heart. I know it's a movie that not very many people have seen. I watched it on Netflix. It was a little bit too late for me to do a review, but I want to talk about it because I did watch it in June. If you want to go see it, if you love horse racing movies and feel-good stories, sure. But I wouldn't necessarily recommend it because I just found myself forgetting it almost immediately. And because of that, it's the meh tier. Nobody's seen it. Okay, we're going to move on to a movie that people maybe have seen. If you're a Bob Dylan fan, you've seen this documentary because it dropped on Netflix directed by Martin Scorsese course you're going to watch this movie. This is the best blend of music and that style of music and just learning things about these real life people who went on this tour, this weird 
out of this realm, like the things that they're saying to each other, it's so odd, but it's so interesting the way this thing is constructed. And you don't have to agree with everything they're saying. You don't have to be in the same mindset. But the fact that it's so interesting and Martin Scorsese directed this documentary, if you love a good musical documentary that's like part concert, part documentary, I think you're going to love this movie. If you don't like that, or Bob Dylan, I don't know why you're watching it, but I thoroughly enjoyed it. And in terms of documentaries, I think it's great. It's not going to be one I revisit. It's not going to be one that I'm watching all the time. But for what it was, it was great. Now, next up, we have Beats. And I'm going to go ahead and place Beats on the OK tier. But that's not to say this movie isn't worth watching on Netflix. Anthony Anderson is great in this movie. It's a film about a young man who experiences tragedy in his life, and he's too afraid to go outside of the house, but he has a special skill set of putting music together, and Anthony Anderson discovers this and tries his best to get this kid out there and to do things, but of course motivations get in the way. There's a lot of conflict between the characters, a lot of tension. It is a story that is very familiar. It's a story that takes elements from other movies of this genre, right? It's trying to make you feel good. It's trying to shock you. Now, there is a shocking moment in the beginning of the film that I thought was thoroughly entertaining. But overall, I think Beats is a movie that you've seen before. Maybe you want to watch a good Anthony Anderson performance. Maybe you want to watch a good coming out performance from our lead in this movie. He was pretty good. But overall, Beats, I'm not going to sit here and say you have to see it. But if you love music and you love the style of storytelling, it's fairly well directed. And I think the movie at the end of the day is okay. Secret Life of Pets 2. We're moving on. Okay, this film, <laughs> I just, I feel the same way about all of these Illumination movies other than Despicable Me. They're just disappointing. They're underwhelming. Secret Life of Pets 2, I'm not going to say it was disappointing because I expected at this point it's, it's going to do the same thing. And it did do the same thing. And because it did the same thing, I'm going to put it on the meh tier. But that's not to say it's the worst movie ever. If you have kids... They're going to enjoy it. If you love The Secret Life of Pets 1, I think you might even like 2 a bit more. I liked it more. Still don't think it was a great film, uh, but it is one that if you're in the mood for this kind of slapsticky, over-the-top movie where there are certain storylines that don't work, certain storylines that are really entertaining and heartfelt, sure, go watch this film. My next movie is Shaft, and oh my goodness, the comment section for this review is off the charts because Shaft was clearly a crowd pleaser. Uh, it got a pretty high cinema score. People seemed to have enjoyed the movie. They had a good time with it. They laughed a lot. And you know what? I, I can't take that away from you guys. If you thoroughly enjoyed Shaft, that's awesome. It is the now third movie in the Shaft trilogy, I guess. And it just felt like they were putting it together to turn a profit that they did not end up turning because the film failed at the box office. Samuel L. Jackson is funny. And there are certain elements of this movie that are funny. It's just such a conventional storyline. It's like they did nothing new. Every element and plot line of every other movie in this vein, they're like, yeah, we'll do that. We'll do that. We'll even use the same dialogue. The villains in this movie are ripped straight out of other films in this nature. They're uninteresting. The only thing you like in this, well, the only thing I liked in this movie was the chemistry between Samuel L. Jack Shaft and Shaft Jr., his son. The movie surrounding them, it was just an empty experience for me because the plot was so messy. But if you had fun, once again, can't blame you. I have to place it on the bad tier. I, I just think the movie's, I think the movie's bad for what it was trying to do. It was just a messy, messy reboot slash sequel. We're getting a lot of those nowadays, and they're just not working. But we have an original movie in The Dead Don't Die, right? And it's Jim Jarmusch. It's, it's a filmmaker that has done some incredible work in the past. When his movies work, they really work. When they don't work, they usually fall flat for me. I thought this would be a movie because of the cast. You have Adam Driver and Bill Murray. I mean, you have a stacked cast. But it just came together to create another empty experience. June was a month with just so many eh, mediocre sequels and studio reboots. And then you get this original film, a zombie film that is bringing in new elements and new characters that we have never seen before, according to the marketing. And then you watch the movie. I personally was really bored throughout the entire film. And I know there's a deeper understanding and meaning, but where certain characters go, certain plot lines just completely cut off. Selena Gomez's character, that entire storyline why was it in the movie? And then you get to Tilda Swinton's ending in the movie. It's so outlandish and odd. 
I couldn't buy it. I wasn't really invested up until that point, but when that happened, I'm just like, nope, completely checking out. And I did. Now, the film is a bit self-aware, and sometimes it makes a joke. That really worked. You love Bill Murray, you love Adam Driver. But The Dead Don't Die for me... I'm sorry, it, it was a bad movie. I have to put it on the bad tier. Now, this tier list, and I always have to reiterate this, this is a tier list that is completely and utterly 100% my opinion. I'm not going to sit here and say this movie has to be here for you. This movie has to be on the awful tier, the bad tier. According to my tier list, I didn't think there was any June movie that was truly awful because I've seen some awful movies this year. No movie I watched in June came to that level of bad, but there were still bad films. There were still meh films, even some of the okay films. I wanted them to be a bit better. I hope July steps it up in terms of quality, but there were still some really solid movies to watch. Like I said yesterday, haven't seen it yet. If you guys want a review, let me know in the comments down below. Even though it's a late review and I don't normally do those, but I will do one if you would like to see it. Like I said, Far From Home, that will be on next month's tier list as well as yesterday. I appreciate you guys sticking with me throughout this entire video. I want your comments down below. I appreciate all of your thumbs up. I truly appreciate you guys supporting this channel. It means a lot for me. The fact that I'm on vacation, my cousin Joseph lets me use this awesome comic book room of his to film my videos. I have incredible family. I have incredible friends and you guys, and I truly, truly appreciate everything you do for me, and I'll be back very soon with another video, hopefully back in Kentucky. We'll have to see. I'll catch you guys later.